Profit is the goal of investing. Measuring profit or return seems like a straightforward process, but there are differences in return measures depending on your investment approach. This video is part one of our portfolio series, where we'll look at the major return measures and their uses. Number one, holding period return. It is a percentage increase in the value of an investment over a given time. It is used to measure the total return on an asset, more likely a portfolio, over the period it was held. It's simple to calculate if you're familiar with the concept of percentages. And yes, it is expressed as a percentage. So you have holding period return equal to end of period value divided by beginning of period value minus one. We'll modify the end of period value. Say we're investing in stocks, so we need to cater for dividend income. So we have HPR, which stands for holding period return equal to PT or value at time t plus dividend at time t divided by p0 or p0 which is the beginning value minus one then we'll simplify it let's look at an example a stock is valued at 25 dollars at the beginning say we're calculating the return for one year holding period so after a year the stock is valued at 28 dollars and pays two dollar dividend its holding period return will be hpr equal to 28 the value at time t minus 25 value at time zero plus two dollar dividend divided by 25 that's the beginning value equal to 20 percent holding period return is specifically useful for comparing returns of different investments held for different time periods number two average returns this is probably the one everyone's familiar with as the name suggests it is a simple average of a series of periodic returns it's also known as the arithmetic mean return. You calculate it by adding up all the numbers in the series and then dividing by the total number in the series. Number three, geometric mean return. In comparison to arithmetic mean, it is compounded annually and it is calculated as follows. A key difference between the arithmetic and geometric mean return is that in case the periodic rates of return vary, then the geometric mean return will be less than the arithmetic mean return. Let's understand this through an example. An investor buys $2,000 of ETF shares. The fund had total returns for the three-year period as 6%, negative 7%, and 13%. Let's calculate the holding period return mean annual return and the geometric mean annual return. To find the holding period return, we need to find the ending value of the investment. To get the end value, we'll multiply $2,000 with a 6% increase, then a reduction of 7%, and then an increase of 13%. We get $2,227.90. Now the holding period return will be ending value minus the beginning value divided by the beginning value. Since there is no dividend, so we'll exclude that you get 11.39%. Arithmetic mean return will be very simple to calculate. 6% minus 7% plus 13% divided by 3 equals 4%. Similarly, we'll put values in the geometric mean return formula and we get 3.66%. As shown by the numbers, this is generally the case. The arithmetic mean return is greater than the geometric mean. Number four, the money weighed rate of return. It's a little different as it measures the internal rate of return of a portfolio by accounting for cash outflows and inflows. Simply put, it is the discount rate at which the net present value or NPV equals zero, or the present value of inflows equals present value of outflows. To calculate this, you need to establish cash inflows and outflows. For example, what you invest in the beginning and any other cash deposits you make subsequently would be your cash inflows, while any cash withdrawals, interest, dividends, and ending value will be treated as cash outflows. The real reason behind categorizing cash flows as such is because the calculation is from the perspective of the portfolio manager. When we say that the client bought the shares, and that's an inflow, it's because the portfolio manager gets the money from the client to buy those shares, which is an inflow to the manager. Conversely, when the shares are sold, the proceeds are given to the client, which is an outflow of cash from the manager's perspective. 
Let's understand this with an example. Say you buy a share of a company for $90 at t equal to 0. At the end of the year, t equal to 1, you buy an additional share for $80. Now, at the end of the second year, that would be t equals 2, you sell both shares for $95 each. Also, while you were holding the shares, at the end of each year, this company paid $2.5 dividend per share. So how do we calculate the money weighed rate of return? We'll tackle this in two steps. Step one, we need to establish the timings as well as the classification, whether it was a cash inflow or an outflow. So following the rules I just mentioned, at t equal to zero, we bought the first share at $90. That would be a cash inflow. At t equal to one, we bought the second share at $80. That would be cash inflow as well. But the first share gave us the dividend of 2.5, that would be the cash outflow. So now subtotal at t equal to 1 would be $77.5 cash inflow to the account. At t2, dividend from the two shares will be equal to minus $5. And proceeds from selling the shares will be minus 190. And the subtotal at t2 would be minus 195, that would be outflow from the account. And the second step is you set the present value of cash inflow equal to the present value of cash outflows after netting the cash flows for each time period. So present value of inflow will be equal to present value of outflow. Just a quick reminder, the net present value or NPV of an investment is the present value of the expected future cash inflows minus the present value of the expected future cash outflows discounted at the appropriate cost of capital or the money weighed rate of return, represented here as R. On your financial calculator, you can use the IRR function to find it. Also, there's a little trick you can use on your spreadsheet or Microsoft Excel to find the money weighed rate of return. All right, so I've done nothing fancy here, so it doesn't matter if you're not an Excel expert. In the third row, I've just mentioned the time represented by T, so we have t equal to 0, 1, 2, this is the beginning of their investment journey, then the first year, then the second year. And these are the cash flows we just calculated. So in the beginning we have 90, the second year at t equal to 1 we have 77.5, and then t equal to 2 we have minus 195. Uh, this is the formula for the net present value. We have used it, so I just mentioned it here because I have used uh, the formula here, you can see that here, to find the net present value. But before that, I just need to make sure that R is actually the money weighed rate of return in this case, or the internal rate, internal rate of return. Now before we go to R, you just need to mention these, this formula. So it, this is just basically the same formula, cash flow divided by 1 plus R, R is the the discount rate or the money weight rate of return. So at t equal to zero, we have the power, the t itself is zero. So we are only left with the cash flow itself. So something divided by one is that something itself. So we have 90 as it is. So we have the cash flow at zero discounted at time equal to zero is 90. Now for t equal to one, when you use the formula, as shown in the notes, you get 67.39 and you do the same for t equal to 2. Now if you're wondering how could I use r on its own, how did I calculate r? Well, here we're just using guesswork. So it's really up to you. You can go with 20%, you can go with 15%, 12%, or whatever you want. So it is just a rough estimation. So I just go with roughly 15%. The, that's the discount rate or the money weight rate of return. The purpose of this guesswork is just to get the values, the discounted values. It doesn't really matter at which value of R you get those. Now what's more important is to get the net present value and you get that by summing up these three values. So that's basically the summation or sigma shown in the formula here. So you get this value, the net present value of your investment. Okay, now the most important part is 
The money weighted rate of return is when the net present value, this value is zero or almost zero which means that if I somehow make this or force the net present value to become zero, we will get the rate of return. So again, the money weighed rate of return is the rate at which the net present value is equal to zero, or the present value of cash inflows is equal to the present value of cash outflows. How do we do that? There's a simple function in MS Excel. You go to data and go to what if analysis you go to goal seek and see that i have selected the npv the cell now i will force it to become zero so i choose this and i want this to be valued at zero and i want it to change the cell this one so I'm forcing the net present value E11 to become zero by changing the value of R or by changing or giving me the money weight rate of return. So let's see what happens. This is not exactly zero, but it is almost zero. It is close to zero and you get 10.3 and this is the exact value. I just rounded it off. So we have 10.31%. That's your money weighed rate of return. Now in this example, the cash flow occurs at every one year interval. That's why we solved it for annual money weighed rate of return. When you're calculating the internal rate of return, you must use the shortest interval between cash flows. For instance, if you use one month intervals between cash flows, you would choose zero cash flows for the months where there is no cash flow in or out of the account and the internal rate of return would indicate the monthly rate of return. Then you would need to compound it for 12 months to translate it into the effective annual rate. Gross return. It's the total return on your investment or portfolio before paying the management and administration fee. And when these fees are paid, it's called net return. Trade commissions and other similar costs associated with generating the required return are deducted from both the gross and net returns. Pre-tax nominal return is simply the return before paying taxes. Keep in mind that interest and dividend income, short-term and long-term capital gains, are generally taxed at different rates. After paying these taxes, you get after-tax nominal return. The real return is simply the nominal return adjusted for inflation. Say you earn a return of 9% over the year when inflation was 3%. Your approximate real return would be 9 minus 3 equal to 6%. However, the exact real return would be a little lower at 5.82%. And finally, the leveraged return. Leverage is a strategy of using borrowed money to increase the return on an investment. The leveraged return is a multiple of return on the underlying asset. It is a gain or loss on the investment as a percentage of how much cash you invested. For example, you have $100 cash of your own. You decide to borrow $1,500 from some bank at 6% interest rate. You invest the whole amount of $1,600 in a financial security, hoping that it would grow at 15% annually. At the end of the year, the value of the security increases to $1,850. You return the loan to the bank, $1,500 plus $90 interest payment equal to $1,590. And now you're left with $260. When you subtract your initial amount of $100, you net $160, which is 160% profit. That's your leveraged return. Leveraged investment in real estate is common. You as an investor only pay a portion of the cost of the property. The rest is borrowed. Hope you liked the video. I highly recommend that you go through our portfolio series chronologically as there will be advanced strategies in the later episodes. Thanks for watching. I'm Niall from SAMT. See you very soon.